All right, good morning, everybody. It is 9.30. We're going to get started today. A uh, couple things before we begin our lecture on Buffalo Bills. Let's look at Flipgrid first. Guys, I only have... I'm sharing screen right now. Let me show you. Screen two. All right. I only have seven videos from yesterday's daily check-in topic. It's right there. Seven responses, guys. I need everybody's responses in there. Uh, please don't forget to do that. That's our check-in at the end of the day. And if we can't do that, I'm going to make you come back at 1.30 before we have to go out so I can make sure everybody's here. I don't want to have to do that. So please make sure you're doing your flip grid. For those of you who have, I've been uh, replying. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. It helps me. And for those of you who have asked for help, hopefully I've provided it. So let's get going with that. All right, today we are going to be going over this poem. It's by E.E. E. Cummings, Edward Eshlin Cummings. He was a poet that lived in the early part of the 19th century. It's going to become a little bit relevant uh, coming up here. And uh, that's just basically for uh, some context in his poem. It's a weird looking poem. Uh, it doesn't follow traditional prose and it looks kind of funky on the page. Remember that we are using soapstone to analyze this poem. I have a couple questions on soapstone, so I'm going to address them right now. This <clears throat> is in your teams. This tells you exactly what to put in each of these boxes. Each of these has some questions. Identify who's telling or giving. Is it an omniscient narrator? Is it a character? Is it an author? All you have to do in these boxes is answer the question. You answer the question in not one sentence, but one or two. Um, I'm going to go ahead and give you credit. I have so far for many of them. I'm still plowing through grading today. You'll be seeing some of that coming soon. But make sure you're typing in the answers to these questions. If you follow this, you're going to get full points. Okay, Answer it to the best of your ability, especially with something like uh, this poem coming up. I'm going to give you all the answers, so make sure you're taking some notes. My point in all of this is not to say, ha ha, I got you, you don't know what this poem means. That's not it. I want you to try and get to understand poems. I want to get you to try and look deeper into things and um, start to analyze them. Okay, words are powerful. Words on pages are powerful. So let's go ahead and get to Buffalo Bills. I have a YouTube video on this that I did, oh God, I don't know, uh, 2013. Um, so if you want to go back and look at that, it's on my YouTube. It's kind of funny to look at it now. Uh, the funny thing that I thought, just the quality of video, I recorded with the best thing that I could find at the time, uh, which was like an expensive video camera. And um, I set it up, and it was so hard to actually set it up and then write on the paper. And yeah, it was kind of crazy. Um, and today, all I have to do is throw it on the screen and talk to you about it. So we've come a long way. Let me show you. So this is what Buffalo Bills looks like on my YouTube channel. Okay. <laughs> you can see it's kind of crappy. So we're going to move on to uh, Buffalo Bills today. Hopefully you got something to take notes with, or you can go back and watch this loom after. That's why I record them, but I got my notes out. And we're going to be going over Buffalo Bills. So... Buffalo Bills is a poem by a man named E.E. E. Cummings, Edward Eslin Cummings. Uh, he's known by E.E. E., and he is known for his odd placement of words on page. It's very original. He's known for enjambment, which means that one line stumbles into the next. And he's known for his odd punctuation or not having any at all, as you can see in the poem on the screen, Buffalo Bills. Um, let's jump into the poem. Buffalo Bill's defunct, who used to ride a water smooth silver stallion and break one, two, three, four, five pigeons just like that. Jesus, he was a handsome man. And what I want to know is, how do you like your blue eyed boy, Mr. Death? All right. Um, if you don't know who Buffalo Bill is, I'm going to tell you. Buffalo Bill, uh, he, his name was William F. Cody. 
he was a very famous American cowboy. And by cowboy, I truly mean the guy who goes out and rustles cows. Um, not a lawman or not an outlaw of the time, not a famous like gambler from then. He was a rustler of cows. And he got his nickname Buffalo Bill because while they're riding these cows to and from different places on the Great Plains, um, he was known for killing a lot of buffalo. Not very PC nowadays and not very good um, when you look back in history, but he, he was known for being able to ride and shoot and have great uh, skills with both his riding and shooting ability. Okay. Um, he helped settle the Great Plains. That's the middle part of America in uh, Buffalo Bill, or sorry, William Cody uh, lived in the late 1800s and died in 1917. Okay, so that, that's his timeline. After the Civil War, throughout um, about 1917, the middle of World War I. Uh, he was a great businessman. And the reason we know most of the cowboy and Wild West mania that we have in our country stems from some of the shows that he put on. He was a great showman. Um, not everybody could go and be a cowboy but it was romanticized to the fact that this was something that, that um, little boys especially wanted to do. They wanted to play cowboys and Indians. They wanted to go shoot buffalo on the plane. They wanted to ride a horse. Uh, so most of the, the thoughts and pictures you get in your head about cowboys or Wild West shows were drawn from this show that he ran. He was uh, Cowboying was an adventurous and mythic style, lifestyle, and he realized that. And he took his Wild West show all over the United States, especially on the East Coast, because that was more settled in city than, um, and major population areas than the West, right? And when we think of West, we're, especially when we think of um, Buffalo Bill, we're thinking of the, from the Great Plains to about Colorado, okay? Not so much the West Coast, but the Great West and the Great Plains. Um, he started the notion of a Wild West show um, he brought other people in with him. Uh, Annie Oakley was a very uh, popular one at the time. She was a, a woman sharpshooter, and um, she was great alacrity with a gun, uh, shooting clay. They used to put on these shooting demonstrations, um, and that's kind of what some of this um, this poem speaks to. Um, they used to do horse wrangling. They used to tell stories. They used to do exhibition shooting, and he was a real, like I said, a showman and a salesman. Um, they did fast shots. They did accurate shots. They did kind of some things you would think of as like a rodeo nowadays, like cow uh, horse riding and dressage and um, cow cattle roping, all kinds of stuff like that. This is kind of where they got their roots from, from that sort of show. Um, he was, it was very, very popular at the time. It made him a very wealthy man. Toward America and Europe, like I said, and at the end of his his uh, kind of popularity of his show, they had 50 train cars that they would take from place to place to set up um, their show. And it run, I think the cost was like $4,000 a day, which back then was an insane amount of money. To be able to pay all of these people, uh, at the height it was like 500 people involved in this show, um, wrangling the horses, setting up, all kinds of stuff. They brought Indian life to the people who couldn't see it either, the Plains Indians. So he had an Indian troop with him as well. Uh, I think it's rumored that like Sitting Bull toured with him after the whole thing that happened and they were moving Indians to the reservations. He brought awareness to Indian life by bringing these people with him. Uh, if you've ever been to Knott's Berry Farm, the Great Train Robbery and the Wild West Show are two of the things that would have been right at home in a uh, Buffalo Bill Wild West Show. So that's kind of what we're thinking of. And that's what he was known for. He was known for his showmanship. He was known for being able to shoot. He was being able, known for being able to ride. So this kind of is an homage to him right now, right here, what we're, what we're uh, looking at in the poem. So into the poem. Uh, Buffalo Bill's defunct. Now, it's an interesting word choice. He didn't say Buffalo Bill's dead. He didn't say Buffalo Bill died. He says Buffalo Bill's defunct. Now, defunct means no longer existing or functioning. Now, technically, it is a word for death, but it's not something that you would associate with a person, right? You don't say, you know, my uncle defunct is defunct. 
or, you know, my grandma, you know, caught the flu and is now defunct. No, it's an odd word choice, which makes it something we look at, right? Uh, who used to ride a water smooth silver stallion. Interesting uh, use of words there. Um, who used to, he's dead now, he doesn't anymore, ride a water smooth silver stallion. There's a lot of S sounds right in here. That's called alliteration. And it makes your tongue slide over the words. Water smooth silver stallion. Um, if you can tell right now, there's enjambment going on. He doesn't, these line breaks don't mean you stop. You just keep reading, right? But it sets up interesting visuals on the page. Ride a water smooth silver and stallions down here. It's like he's riding the stallion, right? But not, he's leaning over to the side, something you might do in a, in a Wild West show. Um, silver, silver is not really a, a color that you uh, associate with a horse, right? Horses are brown, horses are black. Uh, mulatto, there's uh, speckled, all kinds of different things, but silver isn't one that you're going to really associate with being a horse. And horses, I don't know if you've ever ridden a horse, horses are not smooth. There are a lot of bulgy muscles, uh, especially around the, for the, the locks and the forelocks and the legs and stuff, right? Um, and riding a horse itself is not a smooth endeavor. You're jostling all over the place, especially if you're a novice rider like I was when I rode a horse, okay? Barely able to stay on the saddle. Every time the horse steps, you're moving back and forth. Um, and if you're not very good at it, it feels like you're going to get thrown off, especially if the horse starts doing something you don't expect, right? So it's a little bit of a reach to talk about a water smooth silver stallion. It, it sets up a couple of different things. Like was the horse water smooth or was the way he rode it very smooth, which would tell you about his skill as a horseman, right? He used to ride a water smooth silver stallion, okay? Um, colors have meaning. What is silver but shiny gray? And how do you make gray? You make gray with black and white. Now there's a trope in um, Old West that the hero would always come in on a white horse or ride a white horse or have a white hat and the villain would have a black horse and have the black hat. And that's how you know the good guys and the bad guys um, in your Wild West shows, okay? That has spilled over into all aspects of society. Um, Star Wars, look at Star Wars. Think about the original Star Wars movies. Whenever you see Luke, he is in a very light colored, um, especially in the first and second one, he's in light colored robes very white or light or tan think about darth vader what's darth vader darth vader is all black right so setting up good and bad through coloring that's what we're doing here if you want to think about it that way not only was uh buffalo bill a combination of the two but being shiny and being a light source that's what that's what being shiny is it's a reflection right so did he reflect both good and bad that's kind of what they're getting at in water smooth silver stallion also, stallion, that is an interesting choice of words. If you know anything about animal husbandry or horses, a stallion is a horse that gets put out to stud. It has not been gelded. Now, if you don't know what those terms are, you probably should look them up, but there is a definite meaning behind the fact that he rode a stallion and not a mare and not a gelding, okay? Uh, and break one, two, three, four, five, pigeons just like that, all right? This is talking about his shooting prowess. He shot, boom, 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 right? Um, and pigeons, pigeons that they're talking about here, these aren't the, the flying rats we see around school, right? These are actual clay pigeons that you use um, in shooting and target practice, okay? So that's what these are, clay pigeons. They're about three or four inches in diameter. Today, they're colored like bright orange so you can see them. And people used to throw them up and then somebody else would shoot at them to show uh, how much of a crack shot they are. Uh, and look at the uh, spacing here on these lines. And break. One, two, three, four, five. Pigeons just like that. All run together. And why are they all run together? So you have to say them quickly and together. Which shows the speed at which he was shooting these. Which shows his skill. Okay, When you are able to shoot things out of the air quickly 
that was part of the Wild West show. Um, let's see. Uh, like I said, breaks run these together. You read it rapidly, which talks about the rapid action. Uh, look at his choice of capitalization, right? Let's look here. Uh, big old space, Jesus. Another space, he was a handsome man. Look at the, what he has capitalized in this whole thing. Capitalization means something to to E.E. E. Cummings. So we have Buffalo Bill, who's a proper name, who is capitalized. We have Jesus, who is capitalized. And we have Mr. Death at the end, which is capitalized. Why would those three things be capitalized? This isn't a man who goes around randomly capitalizing things. In fact, he's only capitalized three things. What do you think those three things? What do you think the importance are of those? There's a little ambiguity here as well. Uh, does this exclamation of Jesus, does this go with the line above it? Break one, two, three, four, five pigeons just like that. Jesus. Is it an exclamation of, wow, that was really awesome what he just did? Or does Jesus here, he was a handsome man. Does it connect to the fact that he's in awe of not only his uh, prowess, but he was handsome as well? That was part of the reason why he was so popular. Buffalo Bill was uh, kind of a looker for the day, right? And you kind of had to be to be a salesman during that day. So Jesus, he was a handsome man. Um, so the separation of the lines means it could be it could go either way, and it probably does attach to both. Uh, he was a handsome man. Once again, was he's dead now, but he's not anymore. So he was a handsome man. Um, the speaker comes into the poem on this line right here. Notice the speaker is not capitalized. And what I want to know, I, the speaker, is how do you, like your blue-eyed boy, Mr. Death? So he's asking Death, the speaker is asking you, Death, how do you like your, because Buffalo Bill is dead now, he belongs to Death, Mr. Death. How do you like your blue-eyed boy, Mr. Death? Capitalization, proper noun, a formal address, like there's a banter going back and forth. What I want to know is, how do you like your blue-eyed boy? Um, thoughts on the poem itself? Um, it, it's got a tone of awe or admiration. There's a, um, a reverence of Buffalo Bill and his skills. Um uh, kind of highlighting his life, right? Um, like a little like hero worship. He wants to put Buffalo Bill on a pedestal to show that uh, his skills were great and it's sad that this man has now passed. Um, not using the word dying or death until he addresses the persona down here is powerful too. It's a little bit of denial. He's removing buffalo bill from the dominion of death itself by not saying he's dead it's like the speaker is inferring like you've done it now i bet you buffalo bill is with you death and kind of running the show like he used to uh when he was alive so kind of this larger than life action figure is now going to be giving you problems not selling his show here anymore uh, there's another interpretation that you can go over besides the awe and the admiration and um, it's a little ironic right like this man who was the best horse rider and the best shot and did all of these awesome awesome things um, and he was a bringer of death to like buffalo and these clay pigeons right he dealt death on a regular basis and now he died himself, right? And so what he was in life, even though he was awesome and even though he was great, um, there's no escape from death. And that death is kind of like the great equalizer here. He can't avoid his own death. Um, it doesn't matter how handsome or how good a shot or how successful he was. Uh, in the end, we kind of all go out the same way, right? Everyone comes through the same door at the end. Um, so what are we doing with this? Why are we reading this? Like we kind of have to have a focus, right? And right now for you, it's, it's analyzing it. And the great thing about poetry and why I like this poem so much is that you can do so much with it. 
Um, first of all, we have some ambiguity in it. Like, is it a reverence? Is it awe? What's going on? Um, there's a couple different tone shifts in here, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, there's a lot of symbolism going on. Like, who are the three capitalized uh, words there? We got Jesus, we got Buffalo Bill, and we got death. What's the meaning behind it? What's the symbol? Um, is it a glorification of abilities? Um, silver, like, talk about that whole thing. Shining gray, like, what's the symbol of that? Was he a melding of both good and evil and was good at both and, and gets rewarded? Like, silver was used as currency in the Old West. It was very precious and it was worth almost as much as gold. So is that glorifying his abilities and what he's doing? Lots of ambiguity there. Uh, if I was doing a soapstone on this, it would be pretty simple. Uh, the speaker, who is it? It's obviously someone who knew of Buffalo Bill and appreciated his skill almost on a reverential level or almost equating it to awe, right? He's, wow, this was awesome. Uh, the occasion, it seems like it's a memorial or an in memoriam or a poem about a man, kind of uh, um, an elegy maybe. That's a little too um, too elegant. I'm not sure. Um, but the first line gives us the occasion. The first two lines, right? Buffalo Bill's defunct. That's why this poem was written. Uh, what you kind of would need to know in the background is uh, Buffalo Bill and E.E. E. Cummings, like, they overlapped in time. So Buffalo Bill died in 1917. Cummings was born in 1890. I think, yeah, 1894. So when Buffalo Bill died, E.E. E. Cummings is 24 years old. As a boy, he would have heard about the Wild West shows. He probably would have seen one or two. This is kind of one of those um, mythic figures from your childhood that you see is kind of like a hero. And by the time Buffalo Bill dies, 1917, um, Cummings is not only grown up, but he's been to war already. This poem itself was written in 1920, three years after his death, probably after Cummings got back to the States from fighting in World War I. Um, he probably saw a lot of death over there. And seeing a figure like, sorry, I don't know what I did. Seeing a figure like Buffalo Bill, whom he idolized, brought down lowly by death, um, wouldn't be a foreign thought to Cummings. He would appreciate who Buffalo Bill was and the great things that he did, uh, but he would also know because of his experiences during World War I that, you know, death waits for no man type of thing. Uh, the audience. The audience is just a poem reader, maybe a contemporary or an admirer of Buffalo Bill as well. He gives some detail as to who Buffalo Bill is, but not a lot. Knowing that the mythos and uh, the awe of Buffalo Bill at the time would be enough to fill in the gaps. Like, we don't really have to know because it's assumed we would know who Buffalo Bill was. Um, he's still a big figure today, like I said. If you go to Knott's Berry Farm, you go to Old West, a lot of that was inspired by these, these shows that were going around the country, these Wild West shows. Um, but he was, a, like I said, famous figure even back in the day. The purpose, the purpose of the poem. It seems like a, a memorial or, or in memoriam of, right? An, a eulogy, an elegy. Um, there seems to be sadness and awe wrapped up into one here. Um, but he is definitely, the speaker is definitely remembering Buffalo Bills with almost either a rebelliousness or a fondness. Those two things. The subject, subject is loss of a hero. It's realizing that no matter how big you are, how big your public persona is, uh, how much larger than life your, that persona is, death is that great equalizer. It comes to everybody. Uh, the type and pacing of the poem on the page, um, the awe, the, um, the enjambment shows the complexity of the feelings that the speaker is having for his hero, Buffalo Bill. Tone. We've we've kind of reached that a couple times. We have a tone in the in the top up here of definitely awe. Okay, because he is talking about 
what he looks like, what he does, uh, the awe of his skill, and even the fact he was handsome. And there's a shift right here with this second and. And what I want to know, he injects himself, the speaker injects himself into the poem, is how do you like your blue-eyed boy? Once again, not saying Buffalo Bill because they don't want to attach Buffalo Bill to death. It's kind of like a little bit of disbelief, right? Like death has no dominion over this figure that Buffalo Bill is. Like you might have the man with you, this blue-eyed boy, Mr. Death. But you're not taking his legend and you're not taking his skill. You just blue-eyed boy. It's a way of kind of dehumanizing uh, Buffalo Bill, separating the man from the myth. All right, that's it for Buffalo Bill. Uh, like I said, one of my favorite poems because you can do so much with it. If you were uh, writing about this on a test, there's several different ways you can attack it. You can look at the symbolism, you can look at the pacing and the word choice. Uh, you can look at the tone shift in the end. You can look at the separation of the myth and the man. There's a lot that we can do with this. And if you look at it, it's not that complicated, right? It's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve 10, 12 lines of, of text. Well, 11 lines of text in one big space, right? And um, what does the visual representation on the page mean? Why is Jesus separated out there all the way over to the side? Why is, uh, when you look at it, Buffalo Bill at the top, Mr. Death at the bottom, both on this side, right? They're both left justified. And we have Jesus all the way over here on the other side of the page. What's the meaning behind that? Why do you think the author separated these three proper nouns so much and why do they form like this weird triangle right lots of things we can get into on buffalo bills uh, i've gone over your soap zone for today though so hopefully you can pull a lot of that out uh and i can tell you right now on our final test there's probably going to be a, a question about buffalo bill all right that is it for our poetry today. Tomorrow we're going to go over The Monkey's Paw, another one of my uh, favorite short stories. Um, it's about wishes and really wishing and, and getting what you wish for. Uh, I am going to be looking today at the rest of your assignments. Make sure that you have those in. Um, I've done something interesting with our Flipgrid, and I will show you what it is. So this is yesterday's daily check-in. And if I go to edit it, I scheduled it from yesterday to today, and it freezes at the end of today. That means if you didn't do your Flipgrid yesterday, go back and do it, because you can't turn it in after today. Same thing with today's Flipgrid. If you don't do it today, you have until tomorrow to get it done. If it's not done, it doesn't count. And I want you, like I said, I want you to pass. I don't want to have to come in and check in again. Let's make sure that we are getting this part of it done. Uh, you, you guys have been using the chat to great um, success. If you have a problem or a question, go to chat. Give me a text through there or send me a message through there. That's probably the fastest way to get a hold of me. I will be sitting in a meeting right here in the general um, channel. If you have any questions, you can pop in and ask a question. I've had a couple people do that. Either way, I am here to help. We have uh, this week, we got Buffalo Bills do the chapter four through six study guide upload it into your novel group. Uh, make sure you're doing your daily check-ins. Um, we went over Mask of the Red Death yesterday. I don't. Nobody's turned that in yet. Let's make sure we're working on that. Um, we have another poem coming on Thursday called Theme from English B. That is very apropos to what is going on in society right now. And vocab quizzes. Make sure that you are following that link to the vocab quizzes. I have none this week so far. Actually, let me look. I might be lying. Yeah, I have no vocab test from this week so far. So make sure you're remembering to do that vocab as well. Follow the link 
it will take you to unit two. I'm going to show you. Student view, vocab test. It's going to pop this page open. This is unit two. These are the ones right here at the top above play games that you get credit for. Remember, every time you do one, it's five points toward your quiz. You know, I'm going to change that. Every time you do one of these and you get above 50%, it's five points towards your quiz. So make sure you get above 50%. Like I said, the main thing is to you do it so we learn these words in context. So definitions, sentences are fine, uh, parts of speech. Try not to do 10 learning definitions. Try and spread it out among all of these. Spelling, if you really want to, have fun. Uh, but reverse definitions are always good. Uh, synonyms to find which words are the same or antonyms all those are, are, are fine choices make sure you're doing more than just one to get those through I want you learning the words um, alright it's 1001 I need you to get into your vocab groups now you need to be in there remember at least an hour in your vocab groups uh, remember also I can see exactly how long you are meeting for and who is in the meeting each time that you meet. This is the way I take attendance. If somebody is not in that meeting and you need them to be there, send them a message. That's the easiest way for you to get them there. If you're still having a problem, please let me know. I will try and take care of it as fast as I can. But if people just aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing, that's why I'm here. Unless you have any questions, that's going to be it. Uh, if you do, drop them in the chat or unmute yourself. If not, have a great day. I will check into your novel groups soon.